Welcome. Signori, signori, benvenuti. Welcome all to the American Academy in Rome. I'm so pleased to uh, be here with you today and with our two distinguished guests. I'm Allison Emerson, the Mellon Professor of Humanities, interim Mellon Professor of Humanities here at the Academy this spring. And today we have our first in the series Conversations, Conversazioni for spring 2024. Our speakers today uh, are here to talk to us, as the title implied, about current directions and potentially future directions in the study of what we often now call classical antiquity. And I'm willing to bet that that name might come up tonight as well. And we're going to think as well about the how those traditions are similar and different in two areas of the world, in the Anglo-American world of scholarship, as well as in the European and Italian. Our professors are Joy Connolly, who is a scholar of Roman political thought and literature and their Anglo-American reception. She writes and speaks frequently about the future of humanistic inquiry in the United States. She began her service as president of the American Council of Learned Societies in 2019. Previously, she served as provost and interim president of the Graduate Center at the City University of New York, home of over 4,000 graduate students, and as distinguished professor of classics. She has held faculty appointments at New York University, where she served as dean for the humanities from 2012 to 16, as well as Stanford University and the University of Washington. Committed to broadening students or scholars' impact on the world, excuse me, Connolly has advocated for doctoral ed education reform, publicly engaged scholarship, and changes to faculty reward structures. She has published two books with Princeton University Press, The State of Speech and The Life of Roman Republicanism, as well as over 80 articles, reviews, and essays. Connolly earned a BA from Princeton University in 1991 and a PhD in classical studies from the University of Pennsylvania in 1997. Her current book project argues for a global approach to the study of the world's ancient cultures, and I'm willing to bet we'll hear more about that tonight. And she was elected a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 2021. Alessandro Schizaro is professor of Latin literature at the Scuola Normale Superiore in Pisa, where he earned his BA and PhD and recently returned to teach after several decades spent mostly abroad. He previously held chairs at Princeton, King's College London, Sapienza University of Rome, and at Manchester, where he was William Hulme Professor of Classics. His main fields of interest include Latin literature, literary theory, psychoanalysis, and cultural history. He is especially fascinated by the interaction between poetry and philosophy, the role of poetry as a form of knowledge, and the intersection between memory and emotions. Alessandro edits the classical journal Maya, Rivista di Literature Classiche, and is a member of the editorial board of several international journals. A member of Academia Europea, Europea, he has been a visiting professor at Stanford and has lectured extensively in Europe and the US. He's currently serving as the Scuola Normale's deputy director after leading the School of Arts, Languages, and Cultures at Manchester and the Sapienza School for Advanced Studies. Please join me in welcoming Professor Scugaro and Dr. Connolly. So we will spend about 45 minutes in conversation this evening before opening the floor to the group here, um, as well as to the group on Zoom for questions and comments. I do ask that you make sure to wait to receive the microphone before speaking, both so that the community on Zoom can hear you, also so that anyone in the room who has trouble hearing will be able to, to follow the conversation as well. So thank you both again for being here. And to start, I know that we've really promised to talk and to focus tonight on the present and the future, but as scholars of antiquity, I think we, uh, we know that those, those concepts are really rooted in the past. So I wondered if we might start by talking about your own past in the field and how approaches to studying the Greeks and Romans have changed in the time that you've been engaging with them. All right, thank you. Thank you everybody for coming, uh, especially we've had a busy day at the Academy today, so I appreciate everybody being here. Thank you, Allison. Thank you, Alessandro. Thanks to everyone on Zoom. 
wherever you are around the world. It's, it's really a pleasure to be here and, and to have this really, to me, vitally important conversation. And I'm going to make a pitch right now for our conversation. That's a very high bar. But for the study of the world's ancient past or some, however we divide up or think about uh, the study of antiquity as leading the way for thinking about humanistic inquiry in the academy more generally. Because I think if we can, to put it kind of bluntly, if we can fix this, if we can find a good path forward for the study of the, of the ancient past in the academy, whether it's in Italy or the United States, North America, Europe, around the world, if we can do that, we will have gone a long way to anchoring and securing a stronger future for the humanities. And so, so um, to answer your question, though, having kind of framed, having put the bar pretty high, we're going to fix it all, Alessandra, like in the next hour, um, with your help, uh, everyone from the audience. But, but with to answer your question, Allison, uh, I sometimes think about the academy and about changes within the field of the study of. I'll just say the study of classical antiquity, because that's where you started, even if I end up changing the terms of that um, in, in a few minutes. But when I think about the field, I often think of the image of a house, that when, uh, when I was a student, a graduate student in the 1990s, and I would say this applies to the 80s as well, we, can, we don't have to worry about the details of the dates, that uh, the study of antiquity, like the humanities more broadly, was a house that uh, everyone in it was thinking, we have to open the windows, we have to open the doors, we have to welcome more people in, different kinds of people, more people. Uh, open the, let's, let's like actually throw the shutters out, let's open the chimneys, let's really welcome everybody in. And that was happening to a degree, people from different backgrounds, racial, ethnic, religious, different class backgrounds were finding their ways into the, the house of classical scholarship, if I can put it that way. But no one was really talking about changing the design of the house at that time. It was understood that, uh, and I'm sure there were outliers. I mean, there obviously were, because change doesn't happen overnight, and change did come. But the sense was the house was there. It would be stronger if it had different and more people in it. But that, again, the house itself didn't have to change its design. So what started to shift in the, in the mid to late 90s and then gaining in momentum in the early 2000s, and, and it had everything to do with the presence and the contributions of different types of people, more diverse, thinking really big, often coming from backgrounds, intellectual backgrounds, um, that were not limited to the study of Latin and Greek, but people coming from anthropology, from gender studies, from black studies, uh, religion, history of science, et cetera, et cetera, linguistics, I could go on. And all that, that mix, which was very dynamic and really exciting, although not always comfortable for people, especially people who are used to the old way, led to the increasing uh, call, and not just a call, but action to change the design of the house. And I would say we're now in a position, and this is how I would characterize the shift, um, of, of realizing that there are still a good number of people, um, our age, older, even younger people too, upcoming people, people still in graduate school, who have, for a whole variety of reasons, deep allegiances and emotional attachments to the house as it was designed back in the, in the 70s and 80s. That memory of that house design has not gone away. And then there are people who have every reason to want that house to burn down. And what we need, and they really do have reason. So where I am caught because of past injustices and past intellectual blindnesses and, you know, and, and other things we might talk about. So I guess I'll close by my, my answer by saying where I'm caught now, both as the leader of an organization that, um, whose mission is to promote and, and fund, but also get people excited about the study of, I mean, of humanistic inquiry of all types, but especially the study of the past, just because we're talking about that tonight, I'm caught between um, advocating uh, and, and feeling an urgent need to defend the study of the past, and on the other side, uh, how to do that without retaining the damaging borders, structures, rules, and expectations that are holding up the, the, the old walls, um, but how to build a new house again. Because I remember, I've used this image, as I said before, I remember talking to especially emerging scholars about 
um, maybe we need, I, I, I've said, a, a design that's like, a, uh, maybe we just need rocks in a field, like marking out the, the borders. And especially emerging scholars say, we need a roof. <laughs> we need to be protected. We can't, you know, we're under too much pressure and under too many attacks, especially as humanists, especially in the United States, political, cultural, economic. We need some kind of building to protect us. So I won't flog the, <laughs> the image of the house anymore, but I hope it's given some, uh, some sense of the real, like the, the lived material reality we need funding, we need support, we need a structure, we need procedures, we need some kinds of standards and some sense of collective mission for ancient studies. So how can we do that? How can we build the house again, but a new house? And I think that's where we are. Is it on now? Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, uh, well, thank you to the Academy and thank you, Alison, and our colleagues for um, for having us here, and, 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 and to the president, who I suppose is probably on Zoom, but not, not, uh, not here, unfortunately, today. Uh, it's very nice to be back. Um, it is true that most of my career has been abroad, but when it was not abroad, it was actually in Rome. So I had quite uh, a bit of contact with the Academy uh, um, a few years back. And um, I think Joy is right. Um, the Academy could be a very interesting place where to develop a reflection about, well, about many things indeed, but certainly also uh, specifically about the, the, the ancient past um, and, and what used to be called and, you know, is, is, is still often called classics or certainly the study of, of, of Greece and Rome. I have to say as a little tiny footnote, because I will say a lot of uh, uh, perhaps not uh, particularly flattering things about aspects of the study of the ancient world in, in, uh, in my native country, that um, when, when, I, when I went to Rome, actually, uh, this is one colleague of mine here, um, um, unlike most department of classics in Italy, uh, it was actually uh, not called department of classics, but called department of Greek and Latin. And uh, I, I asked why, and uh, the then professor of Greek, Kiko Rossi, said, well, actually, because we don't do classics as such, you know, if you take Greek, we do from Mycenaean to late Byzantine, for instance. And so classics would be such a reductive definition of what this department is about, uh, which, which, which struck a chord, I have to say. This is 20 years ago. And, um, and I thought it was an interesting sort of uh, uh, remark. Uh, certainly was, was, was certainly interesting at that time. Um, I, I suppose the Scuola Normale being a, an, an odd and unusual and small institution um, could be also another uh, interesting venue where to develop some reflections on these topics. And in fact, we are starting to do so uh, in two days with Professor Connolly coming to give a talk. So <laughs> sort of a return, a return visit. Having said that, um, so it, to answer the same question for me is slightly more complicated, although I'm enormously grateful for Joy for putting me in, a, in her age cohort. It was very flattering, it falls, but um, the, the, the difficulty is not so much that, um, I suppose you're right, 80s and 90s were sort of not that massively different. I mean, obviously that thing changing, but you know, it's not talking about completely different geological era. The difference, difference for me, the difficulty for me is that I have to constantly intersect space and time because I was in different places at different times. And so insofar as, you know, I reflect about uh, what I've been doing and, and, and how things were done at certain times during my career, um, uh, I also have to, uh, as it were, uh, account for the change of, of, of scenery, as it were, right? Starting my career in Wisconsin, so, uh, and then I moved to various other countries and so on and so forth. So, uh, you know, I have to, to put, you know, sort of space and time to two axes on which to do that. Having said that, the kind of very rough uh, narrative I I, I thought of uh, in those terms. It's not that different from yours. I didn't think of the of the house imagery, although I've I've often uh, used the the old saying. You know, there are many many rooms in a house, uh, but your right is no longer probably. Uh, uh, you know, um, and we'll talk more about Italy in a moment. I mean, obviously, we went from uh, a notion that you know things were done the way they were because, of course, that was the way they were done. And they had been done for you know a considerable amount of time, or at least we thought they were done for a considerable amount of time. Because then, when you actually you know narrow down and look at the footnotes, there were sort of very interesting you know um, 
seeds of change in, in, in a lot in a lot of, of, of different historical periods. But there was, I think, an unquestioned and unchallenged sense of the exceptionalism of Greece and Rome. And when you say Greece, you mostly really say Athens. Uh, uh, obviously, I'm now making a very sort of, you know, uh, you know, I'm slightly exaggerating for the sake of the argument. Uh, then I thought we, we, we collectively thought it would be very good to start exploring the margins, wasn't it? It was a big, you know, margins in various ways, margins uh, for in terms of geographical terms, in terms of groups that were sort of, you know, looked at in the ancient past. Uh, in terms of methods, you know, you just didn't do sort of, you know, the mainstream, as it were, um, sort of, you know, philological work only. You did, and, and again, I'm, you know, grossly sort of simplifying. Um, I suppose that, in the best case, is brought a sense of decentering a bit, classics, you know, from the uh, Greek or Roman or, let's say, Roma-Athenian, um, you know, uh, core focus. Um, and hopefully now we're moving, or we should be moving, or we ought to be moving, to a more global view of, of the ancient past. Now, where different countries are at different times on this kind of very schematic and slightly, I can see, optimistic timeline, as it were, sort of, you know, like a onward and forward, which I'm not entirely sure is, 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 is fully appropriate, but it's certainly a hope that many of us uh, harbor, uh, where different countries are um, at any given time is, is a matter for debate. And certainly, I think, you know, with, with the greatest possible respect for my, for my own country and for my own um, uh, uh, colleagues and students, I think that the debate in, in this country is certainly not, but this is perhaps a second question, it's perhaps not as advanced. Okay, the perhaps was purely rhetorical, I have to say. Uh, it was purely euphemistic. It's not as advanced as... as um, as it should be, my impression often is that we are, and here we is very local, as it were, it's very, it's very tiny. A little bit, I mean, I wasn't there, but how sort of, you know, uh, French aristocrats must have felt around 1780 or 1775, you know. There was no particular reason why they should think that, you know, uh, guillotines were being read in 10 years' time. You know, I think there were you know, probably continuing to think that, you know, after several years of feudal system, you know, why, why, why change? And why, who, who would ever challenge that? Now, this is getting a bit extreme. But there is a sense that somehow we, we, we do things, by and large, the way they've always been done, and in a way that is effectively the only way to do it. Now, perhaps later on, I'll stop now, but later on we can ask a little bit why this resistance to change, perhaps, um, which I think can, to a certain extent, be accounted for quite, quite easily. I'll stop here. Well, you, your resistance to change, oh, don't even get me started. I, I, I'm, I'm thinking of two big things at once. One, we've, I've talked about this a few, with a few people here um, over the wonderful conversations over meals at the Academy, which is one of the great features of communal life here. Um, and one theme that's come up has been how big these problems are and how hard they are, how hard it is for individual scholars and even departments and even entire disciplines to get a handle on what we might actually do, even if we agree that change of a certain kind is needed. For example, uh, and we were just talking about this before we started this conversation, uh, Alessandro, the, the old requirement that to study, to get a PhD in the study of classical antiquity, uh, one needs to know Latin and Greek. Like this was an unquestioned requirement when I was applying to graduate school in 1992, I think. Um, it still is the, un, the, the, the quiet, unquestioned requirement. But, and I'll, I promise not to use too many statistics, but I will trot out this one. The numbers of students who graduate from American universities with a degree in Latin and Greek, that is signifying that they've studied both languages to a significant degree, you know, to a, no pun intended, in college, has gone down from 20 years ago about just under 800 students in the United States. Now, this isn't counting people who get degrees in classical studies or one language in Latin or Greek, right? This, these are people who are studying both Latin and Greek in, in, in college majoring in that. So under 800 in 2003. In 2021, 62. Okay. So the way we teach, and I'm not lamenting that, by the way. I'm just pointing it out. 
as a way of saying the way we teach, the way we attract students, the experience undergraduates have at, in American universities no longer aligns with the shape of doctoral education as it's conventionally designed in, so, in, in your typical graduate program in, classical, in what's still called classical studies or ancient Mediterranean studies or Greek and Roman studies. Um, in, in the US at the doctoral level again. So I see basically two developments, and this is kind of building on what we've each said. I see two developments coming together. I see uh, falling numbers of students, both in that really support, you know, shocking statistic I just mentioned in terms of that, that's focused on students studying these two ancient languages. But this is reflected broadly across the US in terms of people majoring, concentrating their studies in the humanities. Gigantic drops since the 2008-2009 financial crisis, between 30 and 50 percent uh, drops in English, history, religion, um, really the only disciplines flat or growing a little bit in the humanities in the U.S. are linguistics, communications, and ethnic studies, and none of those are growing by leaps and bounds. Okay, they're, they're kind of holding steady or growing a little. So we've got the one development of falling student interest, and we've got the other development in American higher education of a relentless focus on career readiness, on treating college as job preparation. So against this big backdrop, we now, this is just like further complicating, what do we do to redeem, to make, pot, not, I shouldn't use the language of redemption, what do we do to, to again, build the new house? Um, in light of these developments of falling numbers of students and a, and a university culture that's devaluing humanistic study more broadly. So how can we think really big? Shall I jump forward and put my, no, I'll let you respond to that, Alessandro, and then I'll jump in with my manifesto. Suspense before the, the sort of the, the solution. Now, now we're all outlining problem. Well, since you, you since you're starting with numbers, I, I feel less guilty about inflicting some numbers as well. Uh, I think they're sometimes useful. Um, well, um, so a little bit of background, and uh, probably, uh, um, obviously, uh, those of you who, who are Italian in the room or have experience of the Italian system, we, we will know some of these things, although not necessarily. Uh, they're not necessarily talked about all that much, but I say this for the benefit, especially of our uh, U.S. and uh, friends and 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 from other countries. Um, so um, I'll, I'll talk later on about sort of what Italian classics don't have. But let me start by saying what we what we do have. Uh, one thing we have is that uh, uh, Latin and Greek are still taught in in parts of the high school system for five years, right? Uh, which <clears throat> in a school which is called, uh, quite aptly, Liceo Classico, right? Which is the direct inheritor, I mean, in historical terms, of the German gymnasium from the 19th century. It was, you know, imported as such. And, um, and it has, you know, worked wonders in many ways, right? Uh, but uh, um, it now accounts, and this is something that perhaps is not entirely uh, clear to all are concerned, for fewer than well, it's around 6% of high school teach, uh, uh, students, right, who enroll in that liceo. Um, the, the, the high school system in Italy is very rigid in a sense. At age 14, you choose not which subject you want to study, but you go to different types of school, right? And once you're in that type of school, the menu is fixed, right? So if you, you know, you are humanistically inclined, as it were, you might very well go to liceo classical or other places. Uh, but you know what you're going to find in, in your menu, right? It's not that you can't opt, you can't choose, you know. Uh, you know, my daughters are being schooled in England, and, you know, they, you know, the school is the school, and if you want to do Latin, you do Latin, but instead of Latin, you want to do advanced chemistry, you switch to advanced chemistry. Here you can't, right? You, um, so if you do literature classical, you will do uh, five years of Latin and Greek, a little bit more Latin and Greek, but, you know, substantial numbers of hours per week in Latin and, and Greek. Um, um, but that's around 6% of the student population, right? Um, then you've got that um, uh, Latin is also taught is the other big kind of liceo, which is called the scientific liceo, liceo scientifico, that's more like 20, 21%. Over the past few years, certainly this was not the case when I did it, but over the past few years there's been a very interesting and, to my mind, uh, worrying polarization in terms of gender. The Cho Classico is now very predominantly um, 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 uh, women. 
um, and a scientifico is, 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 is the opposite, um, which creates all sorts of issues when it comes to this is not particularly our topic tonight, but you know, women in sciences. You know, because by the time you know uh, a young woman discovers, I don't know, age 17 or 18, or it, we, we finish high school in 19 here, go to, to university in 19, that you know she actually was keen on say physics, but as Stanley Cho classical, that's it's okay. Yeah, she can enroll in physics. The free free enrollment is not you know it's not kept back from doing it, but probably the amount of math and sciences she has done is not quite there. You know, um, Scuola Romana is a place where you only enter by competitive examination. No one from schools other than Lecce Scientifico win the competition for, 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 for the sciences. Uh, the one exception in recent year is somebody, this guy from Robe, who then went on to win the Fields Medal. So I suspect it's a bit of an outlier in terms of statistics. But normally you can't, right? But sorry, this is by the by. But it's it's an it's an interesting it's an interesting correlation which I will then come back to later for, 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 for other reasons. Um, so um, there is a clear social divide. A lot of students who go to classical come from families where one or very often both parents have, have university degrees um, because the classical was the, at up, once upon a time, was really the school. And even if you wanted to go do a medical degree, an engineering degree or whatever, you, you still sort of like went there, right? Because it was really the sort of, you know, the royal road to, to university. Now, all of this is to say that, you know, this, this is quite, or quite a, a, a weight, as it were, on the system. It is also, um, I don't know, I suppose mixing metaphors is a weight, but it's also a very thin layer of ice. For a practical reason, which um, I'm afraid is slightly boring, I will tell you that, the reason why you still have, for instance, so much Latin taught in universities is not because of students who go and do classics. I mean, yes, there, there are substantial, good numbers of them, but, you know, it wouldn't carry the number of jobs in classics in Latin that, that it carries. Uh, the reason is that if you want to go teach any humanistic subject in any school, including junior high school, even if you never teach one minute of Latin in your entire career, you need to do Latin at university. Once that particular rug is going to be pulled, and there are people who are pulling it as we speak, probably like 300 meters from here, I suppose as crow flies, because the Ministry of Education is just at the foot of the hill and there are changes afoot, we're told. Once that is gone, the number of students who will need to do Latin, they don't want to do Latin, that's for damn sure, but they will need to do Latin in order to get a degree that allows them to go teach in schools, which is still a uh, profession that a lot of students want to be ready for, will plummet. But it's very simple. We simply plummet. So this is one of the and one of the main reasons. The other reason is that um, Latin in literature scientifico is also, or, you know, uh, one foot on a, in the grave and one on the banana skin. So it it doesn't have a, a very bright future. So even if you look at this, the number, sorry for this kind of numerical digression, you are looking at a situation that cannot stand still. You know, I was talking about the French Revolution. I mean, those numbers are just not numbers that, uh, you know, paint a very rosy picture for the future. Um, unfortunately, since there is this uh, sort of, in a way, inherited tradition of schooling, um, this tends to frame the debate in terms of defense. You know, if, 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 if you search uh, uh, Google on... Uh, for the Italian equivalent of defense of the classical liceo, you, you, you get absolutely swamped. Because we've been defending, well, not me personally, but it has been defended for the past 30, 40 years, and these are the results. So I suppose probably you should stop defending it, and maybe you will actually go stronger. But all is this, all is this to say that this kind of strength of the past, and I will talk about other forms of the past in a moment after, after Joy, um, uh, tends to, in a way, prevent a debate about, you know, not, not, not rebuilding the house, but even whether, you know, the house has any cracks in it, as it were. But over to you. Well, it, your, that, that, um, the image you've left me with of, of, you know, a system that's kind of holding on, um, on this 
incredibly shaky foundation of you know holding on to an old tradition for for probably tr not I wouldn't say just tradition's sake, but because of all the webs and structures of privilege, historical privilege that have gone into keeping that those walls up. Um, this is what for me um, led me to. Uh, to the conclusion, and this is what I'm um, working on in the, in, uh, as some of you here know, in the book that I'm working on while I'm here at, at the academy, led me to, 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 to look harder at um, other ways of thinking about the way we organize knowledge about the ancient past. Uh, and in light of thinking about, uh, about the Anthropocene, climate change, in light of my growing understanding of um, the the intertwined you know, constitutive connection between the evolution of the university as an institution and the evolution of the nation state in Europe and then in North America um, as you know, two, now I'll think about trees instead of houses. We heard a talk about, um, about gardens earlier today and that must be in my mind. But if you think about the nation state and the university as kind of intertwined trees growing together, um, that's, that's actually no longer the case um, in the case of, of the university. The nation state um, and the university are very different and divergent enterprises. The university in the United States certainly is a global enterprise and proudly so. Um, we hire the best faculty we can from around the world, which means faculty come from all over the place. Uh, we, ha we recruit the best students we can at, you know, at, at, um, at really all universities in the United States, all colleges in the United States. This isn't just a, um, uh, uh, the, the, the super elite, you know, wealthiest schools in the country. These are regional comprehensive state universities all over the United States that are welcoming faculty and students from all over the world. Um, so that, the, the project we can say of, you know, the, the, the university or the college as the expression of natu national culture is long gone. It's really a global enterprise. The students are global, and the problems we're facing are global. So as I've learned more about, uh, about and thought more, I shouldn't even say learned. I mean, I've known this history for a long time. It's more coming to grips with it and, and taking it seriously as the mode for thinking differently and doing differently in terms of the way we organize knowledge. So we need to be bold. We need to make a strong advocacy argument for the value of the study of the past. And we need to confront the fact that the very design of classical studies, the study of the ancient Mediterranean, the study of Greece and Rome, is key to perpetuating a false story about global human development, namely that civilization was invented in Mesopotamia, it kind of moved to Egypt for a while, developed some elaboration of law and religion, it moved to Greece where democracy was invented, it moved to Rome where democracy you know, became kind of refined and incorporated into an elite government that became an empire. It was passed on to Western Europe. You know, the West was born and then passed down in what Anthony Appiah, the philosopher Anthony Appiah calls the golden nugget theory of Western civilization. It was kind of you know, pat thrown over briefly to Islamic civilization to preserve for a while while things were kind of fragmented in Western Europe, but then taken back and, you know, and, and uh, kind of established finally and as an object of study in the Western European university starting in the 18th century. So this is, this is the story which, I mean, I'm telling obviously in the tone of caricature and parody, but, you know, you go to schools all over the United States, and I would venture to say all over the world, and this is not too different from the story that people are learning there. It's certainly the popular story of the development of human civilization that you encounter all over Western Europe and, uh, and the Americas. It's one though, again, to go back to what I said before, that simply can't stand, not because of political correctness, not because we're trying to do justice to everybody in the global university in the United States, but because it's wrong, it's false. There, it's just, it's an oversimplified false story. So it leaves out, I mean, China and South Asia, to name the biggest examples, it leaves out entire continents of human, human development. It's a misleading, 
and really for, from a European and North American perspective, profoundly self-serving narrative to continue to tell and defend. So how do we combat that and also make the advocacy to bring in the students that we not only need for our material survival, but whom we should want to teach because that's what we're in the business of doing is circulate, you know, creating and co-creating and circulating knowledge. The story I think is one that is of, a, of an ancient studies that is truly global, that gives equal time, equal faculty lines, and this is really, you know, this is where the rubber meets the road as they say, faculty lines, fellowship support, research attention and energy to a global picture of ancient pasts. That means in some ways a much more complicated study where people are focusing on different periods of time depending on the region they're working in. It involves I think more complications in terms, but, but really exciting ones, in terms of comparative work, in terms of collaborative work. It means we're gonna be able to tackle bigger questions and finally put off the baggage of a Eurocentric prejudicial story that classical studies is absolutely based in and I think finally inextricable from. So that's the solution as I see it, the way forward that is both historically more accurate because we'll get a better picture of the past as it really was for people who care about that. And it's gonna be intellectually stimulating and, um, and I think a real kind of flash of light and you know, I, I can talk later about the kind of different skills involved in this kind of work, but it really is, I think, the guiding, um, the guiding light forward for thinking about a way we can ethically, epistemologically, institutionally, professionally, politically defend the study of antiquities, or I'll say ancient pasts. This is where I start to feel at a distinct disadvantage because I think that, um, uh, well, I knew because we, fortunately for me, we've been, uh, Joy and I uh, have been in, in frequent contact over the past few years. So I actually knew the main lines of our argument and I look forward enormously to, to a book. Um, uh, the problem is that, um, uh, you know, to make for a more lively debate, I would have to disagree with her and it would become much more... <laughs> much more interesting, and uh, so no, 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 actually, no, that's all wrong, and sort of, you know, uh, what you should do is, is go. Um, but, but I'm afraid that is, not, that is not the case, because actually I do happen to agree with uh, absolutely everything she says. Um, um, I have some, some concern, of, obviously, as, as, as you just said, about how uh, this can be deployed, and again, I will go back to the chronotope, you know, when and where, in, the, in different places, uh, but um, while you were talking, I was reminded of this uh, fantastic book that just came out by Joe Quinn, uh, the, the Oxford historian, um, uh, which is entitled uh, How the West Made the World, how, <laughs> interesting pun, but sorry, it was obvious, a polar mistake, How the World Made the West, a uh, 4,000 year history, and she starts by saying every autumn I, I sit on my armchair in my, my study at uh, Worcester College, Oxford, and she reads, Oxford requires an admission essay from an admission statement from prospective students in ancient history. You can go just study, not just go about ancient history. And she says, um, you know, every uh, October I read, I don't know, 200 essays saying, I want to study ancient history because that's the root of our civilization. And she said, well, I got so fed up with this that I wrote this book. And the book is extremely interesting. Uh, it's a fascinating book. I don't get royalties out of it, so I can recommend it heartily without, uh, without uh, any, any personal involvement. It's fantastic because, um, not, a part, not, not just for the incredibly interesting story that she tells about various aspects of various cultures and civilizations of just one didn't know, really, including Greece and Rome, and actually, I suppose, uh, Italy and, and Europe at large, but because it has this complete sense of uh, polycentric view of history and relational view of history. I mean, she starts with, um, and then I stop talking about her book. You can go and, and buy it on Amazon or, or on, on Kindle. Um, it's going to be translated in Italian and various other languages soon. You know, she talks about really how people interacted, you know, how people sort of, you know, uh, exported, imported, traveled, learned, and you get a sense of a really much more interconnected world where all this history of 
uh, you know, uh, this linear and sort of, as it were, um, punctual linear and, uh, well, my geometry is such that I can mix these things um, happily without, without worrying, and at the same time unidirectional um, a view of history is completely debunked in, in the first 20 pages, you know, who invented what? Well, I don't know, is what, you know, in philology called polygenesis, you know, I, 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 you know, you can't really tell, although some things you can tell, and a lot of things were not invented where we were taught, uh, uh, you know, they were invented, at least we were taught in, 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 in certain schools in certain countries. I have to say, when you said the narrative about, you know, Mesopotamia, uh, that was a narrative I was uh, taught in elementary school in, you know, well, well back in the past millennium, when, 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 when uh, our daughters went to school uh, uh, in, in, in this city, actually, first year of school in, uh, well, several decades later, the narrative was the same. Uh, it's fantastic. The books were much more sort of, you know, colorful and uh, um, elegant, but the narrative was absolutely the same. I, w I was equally kind of, you know, moved in a way because it complete sort of, you know, literally 45 years earlier or something like that. Uh, and at the same time, slightly worried. It was still that kind of unidirectional sense, you know, um, that, that history, you know, um, uh, China was not mentioned, you know, and so on. It's very interesting. Uh, and as I said, kind of, kind of trouble. So uh, uh, the, the, the Joe Quinn book, it's interesting how, as, 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 as um, Alison said at the beginning, my, 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 I earned my keep as a, as a literary scholar, not, not as an historian, uh, and not even as a, as a cultural historian. But it's interesting how this uh, focus on relationality is actually very important in literary studies. It's a, it's a, it's a fairly re well, it's a recent, but it's a fairly recent trend as well on how you should really look uh, in the analysis of uh, various figures and various um, um, uh, uh, genre, for instance, of, of literature to, to relationality in the text and about the text. And, and some enorm you know, very important work has been done um, in that area. And the whole point of that is that you have got to forget hierarchy. That's the point. I mean, if you look at what, you know, I suppose in, in, in business circle, it's called a horizontal structure, you know, uh, as opposed to some kind of uh, vertical structure. You've got to forget, you know, that kind of a hierarchical position. You know, you've got to see, you know, uh, actors and actresses moving like, like, you know, balls on a field, as it were, you know, in a billiard uh, table like upstairs without one being on top of the other. They just, you know, interact. Uh, sometimes in a completely unpredictable and, and, and random way, but you've got to look. And, and of course, abandoning a sense of hierarchy and superiority or exceptionalism is not easy. I say, but yeah, it's just not easy for, um, it wasn't easy for the French aristocrats, well, I'll stop mentioning now. Uh, I don't know any, it was just, you know, it's something that came to mind while I was thinking about these notes. Uh, well, not any that lived uh, 200 years ago, at least. But, um, uh, uh, and it's not easy if you've always been taught to think, not so much necessarily in terms of superiority, but in terms of exclusivity at least, which of course is often a very, you know, it's the next, it's the previous step to, to superiority is, is exclusivity. Um, that, that is not easy at all. Um, the, the difficulty is compounded by the fact, as, as you said, that um, this more global view of things requires a lot of skills. A lot of skills. You know, you can know Latin extraordinarily well, but in that kind of arena, in that kind of billiard table, you know, you don't even occupy a corner. You probably occupy a fraction of a corner. Um, um, you can do what Martin West did when he when he got his fellowship at All Souls. You know, stopped teaching and nothing to to do anymore. He went to class and he studied um, several. Um, uh, languages, you know, study Hakadian, Hittite, and you say, I went back to school, and, he's, and you know, it's, some of his work has been extraordinarily important because he was able to really put things together that, and again, in terms of relationality, he said, you know, I just went and learned the languages that I didn't know, but without which I could not really understand some of the phenomena I was interested in. Relationality, this is the last um, uh, sort of book review, but it reminds me because, uh, you know, it was, uh, it was also partly discussed here at some point. If you look, for instance, at um, uh, Nick Terranato's book on Rome, right, it came out two or three years ago, um, 
it's very interesting. Uh, the book is very interesting, and the reactions to the book are very interesting. Uh, the book says something that I'm not an interesting story, and I've said it already, but strikes me as eminently reasonable, and certainly reasons for it very, argues for it very cogently. Say, well, yes, Rome, absolutely, yes, it all ended, you know, rather big, as it were. But in dealing with expansion, Rome was actually dealing no differently than a lot of other big city or city states, I suppose you could say, across the Mediterranean, right? And it was very interesting to see the reaction to the book because some people said, um, well, no, 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 but really uh, it was different, wasn't it? It was much bigger and better, as it were, right? You can't, can't say that Rome and Marseille, as it were, were kind of sort of doing the same things, right? Because, you know, it's, uh, it's like a football league. You see, yeah, maybe you all play football in different leagues. There was a fairly, I wouldn't say vicious, but fairly... Um, strong reaction to this idea, you know, was one of the players, and they were all playing pretty much in the same way. Um, a part of the other reactions was, was interesting was, in a way, coming from, from, from a more oppositional point of view, but the same was, well, you know, this was a, an imperialistic, a planned imperialistic attack on neighbors, such as others actually didn't particularly have in mind to do. So in a way, it was criticized both, well, so to speak, from the right or from the left, if you see what it is, so, 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 so to speak. But again, it's because the book is about you know, horizontal relations and not some kind of exceptionalist and, and hierarchy. My concern, as I said, I'm, you know, I suppose I'm, um, um, uh, um, you know, I'm of an age where I suppose learning new tricks is, 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 is impossible, even if one wanted to. The problem is how to, to, to come down to the, to the practicalities, in a way. How do we train these new, these new classicists? So uh, what we can do is to uh, tell them that they're not classicists. That's one, one step in the right direction. Uh, we can give them a sense of the opportunities out there. These are an enormous opportunity from an intellectual point of view. They're not, they're not challenges. They're not... Uh, homework, they're not, that's fantastic. I mean, if somebody had told me 30 years ago that I could actually study, you know, say, Chinese history as part of my ancient studies curriculum, I would have been enthusiastic about it. Um, so, you know, it, it, it's very good to, to, give, to give this sense of opportunity. Um, how do you do that uh, within the constraints of what <clears throat> is a fairly rigid university system everywhere? Um, it's, it's, it's not easy to do. Um, also, keeping in mind the numbers you, you were giving a moment ago, you know, if you still want to talk only to people who come from, say, literary or classical here, or who are part of that 65 people cohort in the whole of the United States, well, uh, then, you know, I suppose the argument is moot. But if you actually want to talk about other skills and other, other challenges, you need to really have a different model of education in mind. I will say a little bit more about that later, but I will now get back to you, or, or, to, or indeed to Alison. And I think we probably will move to questions in a minute. I'll, I, can I just put one provocation? I mean, one, I want to say one word we haven't mentioned yet, which is collaboration, because that clearly we need to figure out a way to reward, incentivize and reward it better and teach people how to do it because it's not easy to do. We, we have such an old fashioned way of assigning, you know, we, we recruit people to graduate school because they're good at writing individual papers and then we focus on training that kind of, sort of, um, but we really focus on the individual student and not on groups, which is something we could consider doing because that would go some way to addressing this. Um, but I just want to put one other issue on the table for us to think about as a group, and that is what, you know, given the challenges of change and the rigid structures that continue to dominate so much of academia all over the world, what can groups or places like the academy do to push this conversation? And I'm going to include the the group organization that I run now, um, the American Council of Learned Societies, which is a federation of 80 learned societies in the, in the humanities and, and related humanistic social sciences. What can we do? Um, something I ask myself every day. It wakes me up in the middle of the night and it helps me get out of bed in the morning. Uh, what, what can we do to advance this conversation in a, in a way that's constructive, in a way that's uh, because you know, we right now, sitting in the American Academy in Rome, we're not sitting in a university space. And I think even just bodily being out of 
the lived experience of a university or a college, however briefly, can help remind us or open our eyes, maybe is a better phrase, a better word than uh, term than remind, it can open our eyes to new ways of being with each other as thinkers, as scholars, as interacting with artists and people outside the academy entirely, working across and, and talking across disciplines. So it's just, it's a good place to think about productive and generative models um, that don't start from a position of loss and mourning and grief for what's past, which does tend to dominate conversations within the, within the university. People tend to start with what they're losing and not what they might gain. So this just seems to me to be an, a really profoundly generative and productive, kind of optimistic and confident and more rested <laughs> place to have this conversation than the, the hurly-burly of the university. Thank you. I think that is a great point to open it up to the academy community uh, here in the room and on Zoom. I think, uh, would you be happy to take questions and continue the conversation? Excellent. Absolutely. <laughs> Hello, thank you so much for this. This has given us so much to think about. And um, as someone finishing a PhD in an in a interdepartmental program, I guess my question about this vision, which I'm incredibly interested in, but how would that actually look substantially different than the way history departments are organized currently? Um, so what would that look like on the, on the ground in terms of departmental organization? Sorry, do you mind telling us, uh, you said interdepartmental program in what? Uh, uh, classical studies, actually. It's called okay. classical studies, but it's between um, classics, history, art and archaeology, and actually philosophy. And where's that? Columbia. Oh, right. Okay, thanks. No, just, I'm, I'm curious. Because organizations are, are important. But even then, it's, it's misleading because there's also a classics department at Columbia, so it's very confusing. Yeah, the organizations are amazing, are, are so intricate. I'll, I mean, I, I'll, I'll take a first stab at this. One, um, one problem in, in writing this book, frankly, that I've been wrestling with for a few years is uh, whether, and I'll, I'll put it kind of in a simplified form, whether to go with conventional disciplines or to stick with the area studies, which is also conventional and traditional model of classical studies, although with a new name, ancient studies, the word classical is not helping anybody. It's only doing damage at this point. It offends people who study Arabic and Chinese and, and Sanskrit and, and others. Um, and and it, it's just, there's no good use for it. So that's, I'm just going to say that in a kind of axiomatic way. But, um, but thinking about the the attempts in the late 18th and early 19th centuries of people mostly in German universities to design this thing, Altertumswissenschaft, the ancestor of classical studies, it was a, an attempt to do a holistic approach to studying, in this case, you know, carefully defined Greek and Roman civilization, and I use this all one word, Greece and Rome was the, contract they were, the construct they were trying to study. And, and so for really for the last several years, um, I thought I, I was caught and on different days I would wake up with different answers. You know, should we try to stick with this holistic interdisciplinary form or follow the path of devolving to history, linguistics, follow the path of people like Sheldon Pollock at Columbia arguing for um, a renaissance in, although he wouldn't use that word, <laughs> being more historically sensible than I just was in using it, uh, for a rebirth, I'll say, of philology as a discipline. World philology is what he calls it. Um, and in the end, given these two paths, so the holistic study versus the let's split off into disciplines, um, I've decidedly plumped for the first, for the area studies model, partly because I think the advantages of in inter and transdisciplinarity are so clear. Um, and also because um, I don't see the, in, in, in the kind of parlous times in which we live, I've had too much administrative experience as a dean and a provost of seeing scholars in Asian studies, African studies, South Asian studies, let alone classical studies, and Greek and Roman studies. I've seen a lot of struggling for little pieces of the pie in history departments, in linguistics departments, in literature departments. And it's so easy in our TikTok world to forget everything pre-1989, or maybe even now it's like pre-2011. So 
allowing, you know, putting scholars in disciplines in some ways might be epistemologically or kind of institutionally make more sense, but realistically, pragmatically, and then also, I think, epistemologically and ethically, it, it doesn't make sense to allow scholars to devolve into disciplinary departments, that we should take the best of what those late 18th and early 19th century scholars were trying to do, which was holistic, transdisciplinary, imaginative, creative, uh, collaborative, at their best, forms of study of the past and you know, rebuild from there. So, um, so historians, as now, might choose to get jobs in history. People studying language might choose to go to linguistics, but to try to sustain you know, a globally defined discipline of ancient studies, for all the reasons I've just said, I, that's, um, that's why I've kind of finally framed the book with that argument. But it was a long path <laughs> of, of thinking about the advantages and disadvantages of both. It's a really good question. We have a question from Zoom. Judith Hallett asks, in teaching classics from 1968 through 2018, I was inspired to build a new house in response to the demand that in university instructors expand their pedagogical repertoires to include an even foreground classical reception, a wide and diversely defined intellectual realm for which we had little, if any, formal background, forcing us to reinvent ourselves as researchers as well as teachers. Does a focus on how later cultures interact with quote unquote classical antiquity have wide architectural promise. I was actually answering the previous question in a way, but hello to, to Judith and thank you very much. I will say perhaps a couple of things, but then I'll let Joy take a hit. Is that all right? Um, this is, um, I said at the beginning that I didn't want to sound too polemical and I, I, I don't think I have been, but when um, you asked a question about the um, you know, disciplinary boundaries, and 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 Joyce answered that. I I, I can't not tell you, uh, because it would be uh, really sort of dereliction of duty, that um, initially classics doesn't exist as it were in as an academic discipline. So we are segmented um, uh, officially, and technically, and administratively, in in in, in small microgroups. So, um, you know, you're either a, a, a professor of, of, of Latin language and literature or you are of Greek Latin literature. And, you know, they are, you know, okay, right. But then, of course, you'd be in a different kind of pigeonhole if you did classical philology or if you did Byzantine Greek or, lo and behold, if you did um, ancient Christian literature, which last time I checked was actually written either in either Latin or Greek, but doesn't fall into one of those two uh, Latin and Greek um, categories uh, with the result, for instance, that you know, um, we are really not taught and we don't teach Latin past, say, by a large 200 or something like that. Because, um, well, I suppose I, I, I could teach Augustine if I wanted, but I was never taught Augustine. And uh, if I had written on Augustine, I couldn't have gotten a job in Latin. Um, I could have gotten it in Christian Latin, but not in Latin, because it's a different Latin. It's Christian Latin, so it doesn't count, right? Um, I, and, and this is, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm joking about it, but it's actually not a joke. It's incredibly constraining, especially for younger colleagues, uh, or PhDs and recent uh, early career uh, researchers, who come up with sometimes very interesting ideas. They've got to say, you know what, it, the idea is very interesting, but but you really can't do it, because if you do it, you would then be neither fish nor fowl, and uh, when you apply for a job, that particular project either is too interdisciplinary or is not in your you know, main area, it's not in the area you're applying for, so it's not going to count. So you can do it after you're tenured, and you know, well, then you can do what you like. And this goes back to what Judith was, was asking. I mean, reception is still, um, um, you know, it has a very, for instance, in Italy, very doubtful status in that respect, because um, you wouldn't get a job in Latin or in Greek um, if your work was heavily on reception. 
you could get it perhaps in classical philology, which is a slightly less defined and broadly defined thing. But you, you'd probably put yourself in a very uh, tight spot. And, 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 and Judy is absolutely right. Certainly for, for many years, the study of reception was one way to open the windows and doors and perhaps even put, you know, uh, uh, tearing down some of the internal partitions of the house uh, uh, that, that Joy was talking about. But again, for instance, here you just can't really do it. Certainly not as a young scholar, because you might end up uh, without any 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 job. So, um, but um, um, I'll, I'll, I'll let you answer, Joy, uh, uh, Judith, more. This is a tough one. Um, I I've done classical reception, as it's called, the you know the the study of the impact, um, transformative impact, usually of of Greek and Roman ideas on, and texts, et cetera, on later periods. And I've seen and been happy to see how it's been, you know, defined more broadly over time to include the impact of, you know, kind of Egyptian Hellenistic, you know, so, so the category isn't as strict as or as narrow as when I started out and as classical reception studies started out, which is kind of roughly the same time frame. It, it got going in the 90s. Um, so it's it's with some, um, some pain, Judy, that I say I, I Absolutely. I mean, of course, the study is valid, and who am I even to say valid or invalid? But, but classical reception studies shed light on useful questions. Um, the study is valuable; it deserves a place. And I'm, you know, I'm sorry, but not surprised to hear the state of classical reception studies institutionally in Italy. Um, I'm very glad that the the field has expanded to incorporate it. But I don't see the architecture of the future as based on classical reception. And I don't largely because of the Eurocentrism of, of, of the field, which I don't think it can ever overcome, even if it expands its boundaries to include, as I said, um, Hellenized Egypt and its impact on later cultures. That, you know, the cent I hope I'm using this, this right, uh, this word correctly, centripetal, you know, the force that kind of pulls into the core, that the Greece and Rome construct, even if it expands a little bit to include the ancient Near East, to include <laughs> Egypt, is so powerful, um, partly because the material remains are so impressive and the pop culture pull is so, so strong and hasn't been countered um, in, in pop culture, in the pop culture machine. Like in Hollywood, we haven't had anything like um, the care and attention lavished on Greece and Rome and even Egypt. Um, on cultures outside the Mediterranean. So until that happens, which is not anytime soon that I can see uh, and not really really realistic to think about, um, I don't think that, a, that, that in terms of the formation of the discipline, building a new house, that reception that's based on the Greece and Rome paradigm is the way forward. Um, this isn't to say that the individual work isn't is, 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 a, is bad, and again, I've, I've done it. I've produced some of this work, so I would be, um, uh, so I, I, again, I wanna validate the individual acts of scholarship, but question really seriously the future of, um, of classical reception as the house. It's, I'll say one more thing about it, and that is that um, it's also, uh, in terms of training, it, it, it it raises even more questions in my mind when it comes to quality of work and, and insight and so on, because it's such a difficult area to train in. You're talking about people, you know, notionally having a grasp of of ancient texts and also a later period, which they're typically not um, don't have a lot of formal training in because of the lack of collaboration in the academy. They're usually on their own and they're figuring out as they go. Again, I've felt this as a scholar trying to do this work responsibly. So. So I think it has also real kind of professional obstacles in front of it, uh, but my primary objection is is the the ongoing pull of the of the of this construct, which we need to be undoing right now, which is the Greece and Rome one. Well, j just to reinforce, we round. It was already on. This is not to say that this has been an enormous for, force for change and force for good. So I mean, the fact that you know certain, as it were, is historical scholarly movements um, have um, are not necessarily the answer now. It doesn't mean that there's been, so that we were talking about margins in I, I was talking in sort of very sort of metaphorical terms in terms of expansion of the purview of the horizon of what 
uh, what the study of the um, uh, of Greece and Rome was. I mean, certainly reception has been an enormously liberating force, you know, if nothing else, because, again, if you want to think of in terms of hierarchy and, and fixity of meaning, of meaning, sorry, uh, reception taught us, certainly taught my generation, that there was a fluidity of meaning over time and cross time. And that, you know, that meant, you know, uh, debunking some of the, uh, you know, uh, as it were, the, the, the monolithic aspect of, 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 of certain mainstream reading, which of course, when you start looking at that, we're all kind of, you know, uh, male-centered and, uh, you know, white-centered and all sorts of centered, you know, iPhone-centered. And, and reception was one, at least certainly my experience, was one of the ways you, 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 you learned, you were taught that actually things could meet, not just the text, as it were, themselves, as it were, but that the text had life, and the life was kind of morphing and changing, and they were used in different ways, sometimes in very unpleasant ways, of course, sometimes, in, you know, particularly, not, not particularly bad or, or, you know, purely literary terms, but that somehow there was this fluidity of meaning that was a very important liberating uh, force, it seems to me, at least for my generation. So. Now I, I understand. Now that now now the, the the debate has moved on to has moved on and is now focused on other issues. But um, I would say the same for uh, for feminism. Again, it, it, it's 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 a uh, feminist. I, I was I was telling my students uh, just before Christmas that um, you know the women's classical caucus of the um, uh, then APA, now SES, was created in memory serves in 1972, or perhaps 1975, but certainly it was either one of those two years. And uh, in Italy, it was actually created uh, never, because it doesn't exist. Um, it doesn't, you know, I suppose you can say the SES as such doesn't exist. There isn't really a strong academic body that has the same sort of, um, the same, uh, it's not the equivalent. But certainly, there isn't anything uh, you know comparable to WCC, which was an enormous force for change, and uh, still is. Um, and in a way, these are inspirational examples because it means that change is possible. Now, maybe you know this. Maybe this time is more difficult. I don't know. Maybe it's more difficult because it's new, but um, and and because, like I said, some of us are perhaps slightly superannuated. But um, it's it's it's. It's, um, although still enthusiastic, uh, about change. Um, and um, um, so it sounds perhaps more difficult, partly because there are inherent challenges in, in, in mastering, as it were, these various skills and techniques. But um, even if you don't master it, you know, I, I, don't, I don't play myself to go learn um, 10 other foreign languages. But um, at least you can have a, a, a vision. You can still have the kind of interest and focus. and. Um, um, and that seems to me something that we we really have the duty to talk about in our classrooms and 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 to try and get our students enthusiastic about. Um, uh, I was going to. Um, I think I'm next, or at least I was given the uh, the microphone. So I appreciate the conversation and opening up and thinking about ways of thinking about the ancient past. And I hope, perhaps maybe, as my colleague here will know, I'm always the Debbie Downer. So I hope you'll forgive my, uh, my skepticism about these, you know, the fields changing, these disciplines changing. Because it seems to me you're both talking about a wholesale remaking of a university and educational system. Because the ways in which the disciplines were formed, area studies, as it were, oriental studies, or you know, even if they change the name, that's still essentially what it is. And epistemologies of knowledge are formed. That has to be dismantled in order to train people to think about the ancient past in a way that I think you're hoping they do. We're now almost 25 years since Dipesh Chakrabarti says, in regards to modernity, but I think it works with respect to the ancient past, is that people who study Confucius, Mencius, uh, South Asian literature, Sheldon Pollock, he has to know and be able to speak to every person who is here in a classical studies department about what they study, how they study, or else he'd be laughed, they'd be laughed out of a room. Everybody who studies parts of the world which are not Greece or Rome have to be able to do that. No person who studies ancient Greece or Rome ever has to be conversant 
with anybody who studies every other part of the world, and they can still have entire glorious, brilliant careers. And I think unless those structures of power are reimagined, I'm not sure necessarily that this project that you hope to achieve, would, I'm, I guess I'm asking you to respond to that. I, as somebody who does not work in the West, you know, it seems like that's a constant battle. It absolutely is, and, and I think it, and so I've, I've kind of two levels of response, and one is um, that the impact of, you know, the, the decline of student numbers and what's that, what that's doing to hi faculty hiring in, in humanistic disciplines, it, it isn't, it is only, really has only been since 2008-9 felt in the seats of power, you know, in the most well-funded, uh, most prestigious universities in the United States. And that only started happening because the people who had tenure and endowed chairs and, and you know, um, I mean, who had lifetime employment in these departments were finally beginning to see their best students fail to get jobs. And I, I really believe this is, it sounds like a very micro-historical account of what happened at that time, but I think there's validity to, that, to this. So the time frame's a little bit shorter um, than Chakrabarty's great Provincializing Europe book and, 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 and other work that came out around that time, and even going back a little bit further. Uh, so, we're, so it is a little bit Sisyphus pushing the rock up the mountain, and we're just at the start still. Um, but I think the, so the second thing I would say to this is to, to kind of re, recalibrate the time, the time frame a little bit, but then also to say, the trend lines, and now I'm gonna be the Debbie Downer, the trend lines are so bad. They are catastrophic for humanistic study in the United States. The numbers of students in every discipline, with the exception of the few I mentioned at the beginning, are going down, or they're flat. It's not sustainable. So to stay on the path we're on, you know, it's change or be changed. I do fear on my worst days, and this is like the three o'clock in the morning waking up and saying, oh, People are not going to move fast enough. They're not going to be bold. They're not going to be able to work together because they're fragmented in this horrible, hierarchical, competitive, you know, internally competitive situation across universities and colleges. But then on my better days, I think, well, even if that fear <laughs> is there, we have to think past it and think about how to organize together to make this possible. So I'm, I'm both agreeing with you and saying, yeah, it's that knowledge we, you know, with us with a slightly more forgiving time scale, we now need to work together and plan if this is gonna happen because the path we're on and trying to preserve to fight it, we know that that's gonna fail because we've had 50 years of failure on that, on this kind of preservation. And since 2008-9, just a collapse. So I, I do wanna say sometimes I get in trouble for talking in these terms because people say, we've talked about the crisis of the humanities forever and this just makes it worse because it damages morale and you're contributing to the problem. But I think you know we can't be ostriches. We've gotta recognize the numbers in front of us and be honest and then say, okay, it's not the end of the story. That's just where we start. Now let's do the work. Um, I wanna speak to or pull a few things you've said together and ask a question. Um, you mentioned doing research responsibly or scholarship responsibly, and you also mentioned this sort of gap in the way the university structure works and uh, who has lifetime employment in these departments and therefore determines what kind of students are allowed into them. I think I'm an interesting case study in that I am in a ancient Mediterranean, or I'm working on a PhD that focuses on the ancient Mediterranean, but I don't have any classical background at all or ancient background at all um, prior to going to this particular grad program. So I'm at ISA, just, uh, and I'm a sculpture conservator by training. I have art history and chemistry backgrounds with a focus on contemporary art. <laughs> and I have found that it's really difficult to figure out how to do research responsibly in this kind of environment because all of the mentors available to me have a completely different methodological approach and training. And I wonder how you see closing that gap in the short term if the goal is to get to a point where different methodologies, different intellect, I mean, I'm only talking about intellectual backgrounds at this point, are invited to participate in a conversation about ancient pasts. Yeah. 
<laughs> so I'm going to get. I'll I'll be really uh, so I'll, I'll I want to say something kind of glib, which is not really fair, but but it's true. I think that 10 or 15 years ago, you might not have found your way to where you are, right? So the field has changed that much, you know, to be able to kind of to incorporate someone of your skills and outlook into it. So that I would take that as a sign of great progress and, and promise. Um, and I guess the so the the the, the real meat of meat or tofu of my answer rather, as I recently stopped eating meat, is uh, is this to, that it's on us to analyze, ref, and and reflect on what is working for you and 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 students like you and scholars like me as I try to think about what it would mean for me to collaborate on a question, on a, on a research question. And, and work from there. And I know that sounds maybe kind of hopelessly banal um, or, or too micro again, but I don't think there's any other way forward. So it's kind of working on two levels, the kind of grand vision of epistemic justice and institutional transformation at a time of generational collapse, but doing it through kind of micro habits of scholarship and study, and then insisting on getting them recognized and replicated using whatever forms we can you know, conversation here, conversation in our disciplines, in our departments, and so on. Uh, oh, sorry. No, thank you. Uh, thank you. Yeah. So, so, this has been very insightful, and I'm not in the academic world, but we hear a lot about the hurdles, both big and small and the term failure was used. And I wonder if you were able to sit down with some key people, less than a handful, at an institution you were involved in, a university, American university, because we, we're not, probably not gonna solve, have, have everything work the same way in the US and in Italy, but an American university, and you were briefly asked to talk about the architectural model of how you would like to see it, which would also help maybe a lay person leave this room to tell other people what needs to happen. I just wonder if you could briefly describe that architectural model of, of how you'd like to see it work. Like if you're emperor of the empress of the universe for a day kind of question. Um, <laughs> the, uh, so I, I'm, I'm gonna hedge one, in one way just to say there are gonna be a lot of solutions, like there are gonna be plural solutions to this institutionally, partly because, and that's a, not a bad thing, partly because we do have things like endowed chairs that are gonna, you know, so funds will have to be redirected and redefined. It, 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 so I wanna embrace that plurality and not set the bar as, or, or you know, map out a, a way forward that's, here's the one answer, and if we don't get there, we're failing, you know, because there are gonna be multiple answers, plural answers. Um, some, in, some of them in some institutions may well go down the road of the devolving to disciplines and, and not having a kind of area studies uh, model or, you know, interdisciplinary model as I'm proposing. But for those that do choose an interdisciplinary model, it does mean, a, a, imagine, a humanities faculty, a humanities and social sciences faculty, humanistic social sciences faculty, and arts faculty sitting down and talking about these issues of epistemic justice and making really hard decisions about redistributing money and resources to make the landscape equitable. So that means looking at the world and, and it won't be perfect and it will be an ongoing story, but redefining lines and space in the university so that, you know, to be really nitty gritty about it, we don't have in fancy research universities the landscape we have now, which is, and I'm gonna upset and distress people listening probably, but right now we have departments of French and departments of Italian and departments of Spanish and Portuguese and departments of German or Germanic languages and departments of English or literatures in English. It's and then we have departments or programs of Asian studies and African studies, right? We don't even recognize in the North American university for the most part, entire continents like Australia, right? They're just essentially, they don't exist except a couple of specialists here and there. If we're serious about producing knowledge for global crises and remembering a global past and educating global citizens, and if we're just curious and we have joy and knowledge <laughs> for all these reasons, the redistribution of the map of humanistic knowledge um, to reflect the real globe is what has to happen. 
So it, you know, this is like, that's the real like wave a magic wand um, and redistribute lines and disciplines and area studies so that it equitably reflects you know, the world and the world's needs. Um, I, I don't want to just, I don't want to end there because that's pretty utopian, like that's, and that's um, maybe virtually impossible for people to imagine. But there are intermediate steps, I think, within existing departments to redistribute and reorganize the distribution of knowledge through the, through the redistribution of, of resources that are absolutely thinkable that take significant steps along the path I just outlined. I can't resist saying, I also think we need to put humanists and departments in schools of law and medicine and business and public health. I mean, I think the way the humanities have um, have put themselves on an island within kind of arts and sciences as it's, tra as it's traditionally defined is also really, is, is profoundly self-destructive, but that's a topic for a whole other conversation. So, but it is part of my, uh, the, the real kind of utopian vision and may be practically part of the solution in some institutions, I think. Okay, <laughs> thank you both so much. Um, Alessandro, I was wondering if I could ask you to talk actually a bit about a third country in the United Kingdom and its role, especially in literary studies um, as sort of the, I don't have a good metaphor, threshing floor um, or um, pack packaging unit for a lot of what happens in the United States, especially the major presses um, being sort of mandatory for um, disciplinary relevance and how um, that might also affect how the conversation in the, U in the UK might actually affect the disciplinary conversation in the US. And I was hoping that Joy, I, I, you mentioned that you see a lot of loss and grief and mourning among people. And I, to me, that's indication of attachment. Um, and I'm wondering it, how you talk to people who are deeply attached to use that attachment um, as a motivating force rather than as a sort of um, limiting limiting force. Thanks both so much. Well, thank you. I'll, um, if you don't mind, I'll also briefly answer the second question because I thought it was very interesting and you know, it was something I was thinking about both when I was preparing for today and, and during today. But the first question is, 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 is a very good point. Um, um, where, where, do, do United, where do United Kingdom uh, universities, Great British, uh, Great British universities stand now? Well, um, that is um, a bit problematic because um, the financial pressures on British universities are enormous. And whoever wins the next elections will have to tackle that. It's still, a, well, you can't say publicly funded. It's funded by students getting into enormous amounts of debts, but it's effectively uh, government regulated, right? So even fees are set by government. And, you know, I won't go into that. Maybe after two glasses of wine, but not before that. Um, um, so it's still a very regulated system and the financial pressure on departments like classics or whatever you want to call it are enormous because the national pool of students doing some sort of classical subject, including classical civilization without Latin and Greek at high school level, and then therefore being able to enroll in, um, in a classics degree or in interdisciplinary degree, although interdisciplinary is, is slightly different, um, is very, very small. It's not as small as, uh, say, religion and theology, but it's very small. And it's dominated by, of course, some of the very old and prestigious universities. And many of those students come from, uh, effectively, the private sector. In, in, in Britain, one of the most glaring um, differences vis-a-vis -vis both the US and the Italian uh, educational system is the uh, predominance of um, in, in, in the school sector on the university sector, or the private element, right? Seven percent of students are privately educated in uh, in, uh, in Britain, and uh, they used to bag around forty percent of the Oxbridge entrant places. And with, with enormous efforts, I think we're now down to thirty-five or something like that, just to give you a sense. And of course, um, you know, Eton is not going to cancel Latin and Greek anytime soon, whereas many state schools. Um, for a variety of reasons, dispense with that as they dispense sometimes with music, as they dispense with foreign languages. You know, there's this focus on you know maths and um, English. You know, 
um, sometimes history, but um, it's a very kind of reduced uh, uh, curriculum, as it were. Um, so the, the, the future in that respect is not very bright. And I have to say that much as I was, I was just sort of, you know, expostulating about the uh, subdivision of Italian classics in various groups, the single on degree, which is still the predominant mode of university education in Britain, you know, you go there to do three years of ancient history or of classics or of French, with some mix and match, but basically that's what you still do and what most people expect to have, is not conducive, not, not just to, 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 to the vision that the joys was, was uh, putting forward, but not even to uh, sort of a broader view of the humanities. After all, in Italy, if you want to get a degree in classics, you actually don't get a degree in classics, you get a degree in humanities with a focus on classics, you still have to do Italian literature and history or art history and something like that. It's a slightly broader base. Then you do a lot of Latin and Greek within that, but you do uh, a, a, a sort of, you know, uh, whereas you don't. I mean, if you do classics in Britain, you do Latin and Greek for three years or four if you're at Oxford. You don't do anything else. And that is not the ideal platform onto which to, to graft that even more ambitious plan. Um, so I, I'm not entirely sure where to go. Um, but this is a good segue in the second question, if, you, if I may answer that as well, it was not posed to me. But because, you know, also to, to, to close, because I think we are close to our, our time, yes, on a, on a, on a, on a, on a more positive, positive note, I think we should distinguish, and maybe this is a, um, a sort of, you know, not too nice a compromise, as it were, but I think we should distinguish between awareness and openness to change and willingness to be part of a much broader conversation and what we do individually, if you say what I mean. Um, because obviously, you know, we, 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 it's not just that we can't retrain people like me, but we can't even train the new people, the new generations in this kind of, you know, uh, 360 degrees um, um, uh, um, um, kind of skills, but that is not what, what you're advocating. What one advocates is, you know, a more equal, broader system in which then ultimately, of course, going back to a question I was posed a moment ago, you know, you study what you study, you're competent and proficient in what you study, and if what you study is actually medieval Latin, well, that's, that's perfectly fine. Um, actually, it's not just perfectly fine, which is reductive and concessive, but it's a sort of, you know, it's absolutely laudable, provided, it, you know, one doesn't think that that's actually sort of, you know, the belly button of the world, if you see what I mean. That is not to sort of, you know, the, 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 be, the be all and, and, and end all of, of the past. Not even, you know, not even in, an, in a Eurocentric vision is that the uh, be all and end all the world, let alone in a broader, in a broader sense. Um, I was, I was, I was rem reminded while we were talking of, 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 of a, well, not an anecdote. I was there. I was actually visiting students. Uh, well, you know, I just finished. I don't remember. I talked Oxford many years ago, and Martin Bernal's book had just sort of. Um, come out, or at least sort of, I think book is 87, this was probably 90, so it was just, it was just percolating into Europe. And as it happens, I'd been in the States, so I had read it. And I, I went to this seminar in Oxford, an introductory seminar, and it was very interesting. I was sitting next to this very, seemed to me very old, but I think it was a very old gentleman, who I didn't know was was at the time. And a much younger person actually came from Greece, a scholar. I don't know why, but now came up. And was absolutely furious because, sorry, no, no we, 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 we did it, you know, we didn't get it from Egypt or from anywhere else. Um, it was really, you, you could see, I was talking, you know, I was thinking when you said your personal loss and attachment, it was really telling somebody, you know, no, I'm sorry, you did not invent this and that, you know, other forces were involved, other people. And the old gentleman next to me muttered, and I said, well, but, but Bernal is right. And it turns out, I can, I can say, it was, it was actually Andrews, the old commentator of Thucydides, in the kind of very old kind of Altertum Wissenschaft kind of tradition, um, Thucydides and Herodotus, and somehow evidently, he, 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 you know, he didn't have a particular stake in, 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 in that particular game. And as an historian, he was perfectly open to that argument. Whereas people had more a stake um, emotionally and, and personally, culturally, were much more reluctant to to let go of that. And that is a real risk in Italy. I mean, in Italy, there is this, you know, every time you, you, you talk about roots, 
and classics in Italy, it's, you know, I, I, I vaguely reach for the, for the revolver because it's always a dodgy argument, but it is also an emotionally dodgy argument that, that you really shouldn't deploy. I'm going to add really briefly because I know we're over time, I think, or right at time, but I will just say um, I think the answer to your question actually goes back to Alan's question about the revisioning, which is for humanists today, and I include that, I use that word term really broadly, humanistic social scientists, artists, there are people in schools of science who think of themselves as humanists too, and I think that's a good thing. We need to change the narrative within our institutions by being louder and more ambitious and bolder in terms of the importance of our study and the crucial necessity of it. We cannot sit down together and talk, even if we agree on 90% of things, one-to-one, -one, let alone if we are in, in the polarized society we're in, we can't communicate if we don't understand each other in our pasts, if we don't understand how values work, if we can't reason together. I mean, all the capacities involved in humanistic inquiry are not the kind of luxurious window dressing or the extra luxury of a rich student going to a fancy school, right? They're, the, they're not just the property. I'm actually trying to get away from the language of property. They are needed for human survival today. Communication, understanding language, understanding how art appeals to people, understanding people's past, understanding how people think. And that's how we have to tell the story. And I think in the end, that's the answer to your question of you know cutting through the affective attachments, not to rip them out at the roots, but to lift them up and kind of replant them in a bigger scale, much more ambitious, much bolder, and demanding that we get the space in the university that we've either given up or has been taken away from us. And it's a mix of both those things. So that, you know, that, that's also, I think, the answer to the question of if I were empress for a day in terms of reorganizing the university, centering humanistic inquiry at the core um, is, is also part of the work. Well, I think that is a beautiful moment of challenge, but of promise as well. Uh, to conclude here tonight, but invite everyone to join us upstairs in the Salone to a reception to which you are all invited. And let's thank Alessandro and Joy once again. And if I may, um, Joy Connolly 2024, everyone. You heard it here first. <laughs> you have my vote right away. Um, I think I've, we, we've all been taken on this emotional roller coaster from where, like, you know, we were like down and like, you know, we were, there, there was no, no hope for tomorrow. And then there was up because maybe she was going to become Empress of the World. And then we're down again. How are we going to define classics in the ancient world and the ancient Mediterranean? But I think that what's really central to what we've seen here today, and I think what is so special about the American Academy in Rome, is that we are able to have these conversations here outside of a university, outside of a college, where we can look at the realm of possibility and bring together different strands of existences, different understandings of university life, and different moments of historiography and of moving forward in thinking about methodology and what it means to define ourselves as humanists, as scholars, as artists, and as researchers. And I think more than anything, what we've seen here is a demonstration tonight of what is needed in this area, not just in the ancient world, not just in the ancient Mediterranean, not just in the global Mediterranean, but in general amongst artists and humanists across the globe, is the generosity of a Joy Connolly who has come here to write a book as a visiting scholar and still takes every moment to sit down at lunch and at dinner, have coffee, have tea, and spend an evening with all of us in this room and with 95 people on Zoom to share her thoughts on what the future might hold for the ancient world and for the future present. And for an Alessandro Schiazzaro, who comes all the way from Pisa, who has already not just given back to the Academy, but already collaborated with Kim Bowes, with uh, Joe Farrell, and with all of us here, and constantly brings us to this conversation in multiple ways, in multiple cultures, in multiple languages, because it believes that only through communication will we find a way forward. And of course, to the inimitable Alison Emerson, who has just joined us 
in one full month and has already made an enormous change in the academy and for our lives of the humanists and scholars of the American Academy in Rome. So please join us upstairs because I think that our three speakers have truly deserved and earned their Prosecco tonight. And I'm sure they will answer many more questions for you. Long live the revolution.